Welcome to episode 104 of the Family Answer Man podcast. That means this is our two-year anniversary, and today we are talking about what it looks like to have faith in the classroom, especially for teachers from a biblical worldview on the Family Answer Man podcast. I'm David Rogers, and I am here with Dr. Mark Crosby. He is our uh, pastor, educator, he is a marriage and family therapist, and he is the resident expert here on the Family Answer Man podcast. Um, the Family Answer Man is not uh, a therapy session. We can't give specific advice to your unique circumstances, but we do believe that spiritual and mental health are very serious issues. So for in-depth answers to your questions, we want to encourage you to seek professional counsel for your unique circumstances. Before we jump in, uh, go ahead and hit the notification bell, if you will, uh, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, you will never miss an episode of The Family Answer Man if you do that. And if you're listening on a podcast, uh, rate and review us on your favorite podcast app. That helps us out a lot. We appreciate it. And you can always help the Family Answer Man community grow by uh, inviting your friends and your family to join you on this journey of building stronger, healthier, happier families. Well, Dr. Mark, good to be here with you yes. today. Uh, if people want to get in touch with us, uh, this is something we talk about often. Yeah. That, uh, they can get in touch with us by uh, emailing us. That's right. Uh, they can email us at familyanswerman at live oak church, and uh, that's something that we love. Right. Exactly. Uh, We'd love to hear uh, y'all's questions. If you want to uh, have your question read on air, or if they want to ask a question and they, you know, people uh, want to request that we not read it on air, that is something that we would respect. Sure. Um, obviously, we can't give uh, specific advice, but um, we do love that uh, the format of the show allows right. for us to answer questions from you guys, our listeners. That's right. Um, today, we are talking about a fun issue. Yes. Uh, talking about um, faith in the school system. Right, right. And uh, that's a big hot topic right now. Louisiana really has yep. been uh, the first school to uh, mandate that the Ten Commandments go up on the walls in every classroom right. in the state of Louisiana for every public school. Right. Um, and it's the first state that that's been required, but right. that used to be the norm. Right. Well, it was the norm. I mean, uh, many, unfortunately, who do not know their history do not remember that uh, for years uh, school would begin with maybe a quote from the book of Proverbs mm -hmm. or maybe uh, the psalm. Um, sometimes, uh, in many cases, many schools open up with prayer after right. the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, sometimes, uh, for many years, uh, our textbooks, uh, especially our books of literature, uh, had in front of the by in front of the uh, uh, the reader, if you will, for, for first graders or third graders, whomever it may be, uh, they would have maybe the list of the Ten Commandments, or they'd have maybe the twenty third Psalm, mm. or they would have maybe other passages of of Scripture uh, as a part of their reading assignment, and so. So the Ten Commandments and the 23rd Psalm and prayer in school, all these things were the norm uh, for the first half of the 20th century and mm -hmm. even beyond, definitely before then. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, many have never heard this before, but most of our schools uh, had no problem with, again, maybe having a minister come and mm -hmm. uh, talk about Christmas or talk about Easter or things of that nature. So again, uh, for years, for decades, and maybe even for centuries, uh, the uh, educational system of, of our nation definitely incorporated uh, the Bible and prayer mm -hmm. and pastors. And of course, it was Christmas holiday, not winter break. <laughs> right, right. It was, uh, you know, yeah, the Easter, Easter holiday, holiday yeah. and not, you know, spring break. And so, you know, Christmas carols would be sung that had uh, come right out of, you know, the uh, Christian hymn books and so forth. Uh, and then a lot happened. Uh, Basically, the 1960s with uh, Madeleine Murray O'Hare, you know, suing and and many court battles went back and forth concerning uh, whether or not prayer should be allowed in school, or the uh, Bible uh, reading be allowed in school, and things of that nature. And for many, an entire generation grew up believing that this was a secular nation and that God had no place in the public square. The reality is that is not our historical foundation. Uh, but unfortunately, most people do not know their history. Uh, all, you, all you need to do is a, a quick little, you know, survey or poll of some very basic, basic questions. Way. Those are always fun uh, videos about, to watch. About history, <laughs> and you'll discover most people don't know our history, and most people do not know, um, in many cases, basically what the Constitution actually says or doesn't say. We'll right. unpack that more in a moment. But anyway, so there's a lot being said and done. So mm -hmm. again, I, I I give a lot of. Um, 
respect to, to our, uh, our, our state's leaders for allowing and desiring the Ten Commandments, which is basically the foundation of our moral compass, if you will, right. uh, to be displayed mm-hmm. uh, there on the walls of our school. I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, and here's, here's what people need to understand. We'll unpack this more in a moment. And that is these uh, Ten Commandments does not convert anybody to a particular denomination mm-hmm. or even a religious belief. It's just simply saying these are the things that we understand that is the foundation of morality. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll talk about this more in a moment, it was John Adams who said that our Constitution was made only for a free, uh, or excuse me, a religious and moral people. Right. And so, and so if the Ten Commandments is the foundation of morality, then that would stand to reason that our Constitution and the people of our nation mm-hmm. need to understand that morality and religion is who we need to be if our Constitution is going to work. Right, right. And so, again, we have the, the long, longest-lasting Constitution of any nation. Uh, it has created freedoms and opportunities and privileges that are the envy of the world. And mm-hmm. we need to understand that the foundation of that, I will argue, is the Ten Commandments. And for someone to say, you know, I heard some teachers say, you know, God bless them, you know, bless their heart. (laughs) You know, some teachers say, well, what if a third grader sees something about adultery? Well, you know what? Maybe, just maybe, just maybe, instead of having drag queens in our third grade classroom, you know, we can say, you know, there's certain laws that we need to understand, certain morals we need to understand. Mm -hmm. And maybe, just maybe, as you begin to understand these morals, understand these laws, and begin to apply them, you'll recognize and realize that when you do the right thing and the responsible Mm -hmm. thing and the realistic thing, life really does go well. But it's these foundational pillars that we need to start building in the lives of our children, uh, our families, et cetera. And then we found those in the Ten Commandments. And any third grade teacher should be able to understand how to take a complex principle and put it on a third grade level. Exactly. Moms and dads are supposed to love each other and only each other. Exactly. Pretty you simple. Know, thou shall not lie. Right. Thou shall not steal. Yep. Don't steal little Johnny's you know, lunch money. <laughs> Pretty you know, easy. Or whatever. You, know. you don't have to talk about grand theft larceny. Th- or, this, you know, is, you know. this is the reason why we do this. <laughs> yes. You know, and so again, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, but I think we, we live in a very theophobic nation, mm. which means mm-hmm. people are afraid of theology or yeah. deophobic. People are afraid of God. Yeah. You know, they're afraid of even mentioning God or, or some something along those lines. And so, you know, we'll talk about this more in a moment, but it's happening. Uh, Oklahoma, I think, is now wanting to teach the Bible in this public school, which I think nice. is amazing because right. the Bible is perhaps uh, one of the most important pieces of literature on the planet. Right. But we live in this most biblically illiterate, you know, society mm-hmm. and culture. Uh, even though, you know, churches do a great job, uh, there are so many people who have no concept of the Word of God, what it means, the prophecies, the history, the historical accuracy, the archaeological you know, discoveries, uh, and so forth uh, about the Word of God. And so, I'm, again, I really take my hat off to the state of Oklahoma for wanting to do this just to educate our people. Yes, indeed. Well, that leads us to our question uh, for today. Yes. And it's going to be a good question. Right. So, uh, again, if you want to get your question read on air, you can do that. Email us at familyanswerman.liveoak.church. But the question that we have for today says this, is a little bit of backstory. It says, both my grandparents were teachers. Mm-hmm. My mom was a teacher. I taught for 25 years. Now, both of my girls are teachers. We're having an ongoing debate on how much our Christian faith should be brought into our classroom. Some family members believe that we are a secular nation and that faith should be should not be mentioned. Others believe that we declare um, the role of faith, uh, that we should declare the role that faith has played in our nation. So is there any answer that you can give on the subject? And uh, just to know, the conversation can be somewhat contentious at times. Okay. Of course it can, because yeah. you're dealing with God and country. <laughs> right. You're dealing with God and country, there's going to be some uh, debate, so to speak. Well, again, in no particular order, let me kind of share a few things that I think is important to know. First of all, the Bible says that my people perish for lack of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm afraid we live in a nation today where people uh, who want to come across as intelligent and well-educated say some of the most inane things when it comes to God and country. And the reason for that is because there is a lack of knowledge when it comes to uh, this particular subject. Uh, so again, we've been led to believe, for example, that our country was founded on a secular philosophy. The reason why I say that is because every nation 
uh, bar none, is founded upon some sort of religious philosophy. Right, even, no matter what it is. Even communist mm -hmm. nations are founded upon atheism. Mm -hmm. Muslim nations, of course, founded upon Islam, and the list could go on. So every nation is founded upon some sort of religious philosophical framework. The re the, to say that our nation was founded on a secular philosophy uh, nothing can be further from the truth when you weigh the evidence. Uh, so again, what we have to look at is that from the reality, reality is that from our nation's birth, from our nation's very beginning, from our nation's inception, we have this God-based, biblically-based pillars that our nation is indeed built upon. And so if you're not sure what that means, it, uh, call to the stand <laughs> the Mayflower Compact. Yeah. Many believe the Mayflower, the Mayflower Compact was basically our nation's birth certificate. Here's what is written in the Mayflower Compact. It says this, Having undertaken for the glory of God the advancement of the Christian faith, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. So again, the Mayflower Compact begins in the name of God, and then it talks about the undertaking of the advancement of the Christian faith as, again, uh, the people that we call the pilgrims, the separatists, if you will, made their way to our country to, again, to advance the Christian faith. So from the very beginning of our nation's birth, as we know it today, the Mayflower Compact, again, makes it clear what was the intent of the founders of this nation to advance the Christian faith. Right. Secondly, uh, the Declaration of Independence uh, talks about the Creator who has given us certain unalienable rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Many do not know that the original document, before <laughs> it was finally edited, said the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness. Right. And so many never hear that in their uh, history class. But in the Declaration of Independence, you talk about the Creator. You talk about the laws mm -hmm. of nature and nature's God. Right. Which meant there's certain laws that you see in nature uh, that God has put together, that God has put forth. And so the point that the, uh, the, the Declaration of Independence is, is making here is simply that if God gives you certain inalienable rights, no one can take those rights away. That's right. And so the point being, though, but if the state gives you rights, they can be taken away. The, by state the state can take those rights away. Mm -hmm. But if God has given you certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, <clears throat> excuse me, no one can take those rights away. Mm -hmm. And so that's very important to note. So in the first two important documents of our nation, the Mayflower Compact and the Declaration of Independence, both mention God, the Creator, uh, the pursuit of godliness, if you will, the advancement of the Christian faith, etc. This is why John Adams declared, as he said earlier, that our Constitution is written only for a religious and moral people. So if we're going to be a self-governing people, if we're going to be a self-governing uh, society and culture, then again, our Constitution is written in such a way that only through religion and morality can we be self-governing. In other words, uh, I don't want to steal from you because morally I know I shouldn't. I don't want to lie to you because morally I know I shouldn't. Uh, I don't want to, you know, do something that's going to be egregious towards my parents because, again, there's a morality that says that I shouldn't. And, and on and on it goes. And so John Adams declares that our Constitution was written only for a religious and moral people. And we forget that. We forget the power and the importance of both religion and morality, which is one reason why even in our own community here in Livingston Parish, uh, it's a wonderful community. It has some wonderful people, uh, a gr amazing churches, great pastors. But on any given Sunday, less than 20 percent mm -hmm. of our community will be in church. Right. On any given Sunday. That means 80 percent of the people of our parish, and we live in a great parish, wonderful people, uh, we come together during good times and bad times. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that 80% do not attend church on any given Sunday. And so if our Constitution was written for a religious and moral people, my question is, where is your morality coming from? What are you building your beliefs upon? Uh, why? What keeps a person from saying, I know this is right, I know this is wrong? And so, again, this is very important to note. And so my point is, is that this is happening in our community. Uh, what about other communities that have even less right. of an involvement in any kind of church or faith or practice? 
Uh, many have never heard this. The first Bible printed in the United States was done so with congressional oversight. <laughs> <laughs> the very first Bible that was printed uh, in our country was done so with congressional oversight, meaning that, again, the founders of this nation, the, the leaders of this nation, wanted to make sure that the Bible was written, it was printed, it was distributed, it was looked, it was given, it was read, it was studied, it was applied, it was used in our schools. Uh, again, and that's one reason why it was done with congressional oversight, because it was written and it was uh, printed, I should say, so that it could be in our school system. Right. That was the purpose. Yeah. That was the, that was the purpose. Now, I know many who don't believe that, don't like to hear that, but all you got to do is dig into your history and discover that this is why it was uh, done with congressional oversight, because yeah. the Bible was printed in our country to be seen and read in our schools. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to think that we have such a strong debate about how the Bible should not be in our schools. Right, right. And the original intent from the very beginning was that it was it was to be right. the primary right. school book. Yeah, I, I know. If, for example, if you turn back the clock, you know, uh, say 100 years even, and if, if a school system or a state would say, yeah, we're going to have the Bible read in our school, most people wouldn't even blink. At all, right. But now yeah. today, you know, oh, they, they, they have a heart attack. They have a riot, yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> for some reason there is this scriptophobic mentality mm -hmm. that the scripture should not be uh, found or seen in our, our school system, which is amazing mm -hmm. what can happen in one generation. Yeah. You know, what can ha how, how in one generation things can change. Uh, so drastically. So drastically mm -hmm. when for centuries, you know, the Bible was the cornerstone of our educational system. Mm-hmm. The nation's capital, and many have never heard this, was used as a house of worship <laughs> for a variety of denominations. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can go into some of the congressional records today and read and hear and see uh, some of the sermons that were preached and taught uh, in our nation's capital uh, you know, for, for many decades. Now, you're going to hear this from time to time, and, and we'll, again, this is in no particular order, but some might say, well, what about the separation of church and state? Right. Uh, I, I hear that, common. you know, separation, church and state, separation, mm -hmm. church and state. And people say that little phrase as if for some reason it's found in the Constitution. But it's not. And people look at you with like a deer in the headlights. You tell them you do understand right. the phrase separation of church and state is not found in our Constitution. Us people are usually surprised when they figure out where it actually came from and just, you know, a correspondence with yeah. a little old lady. Yeah, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and, and the Danbury Baptists. And so, and so what you have here, again, is this, this, these little cliches, these little phrases get thrown out, and we begin mm. to think all of a sudden they're law. Right. Separation of church and state. Separation. No. It's not found in the Constitution anywhere. Right. And so, and they look at you. And now the thing is, is that most people, you know, again, do not know their history. Uh, even more people do not understand the law. As a matter of fact, I tell this story all the time. I was years ago talking to someone. They were, they were an attorney. Uh, they, they worked for a, a particular DA's office. I'm not going to mention which one. <laughs> uh, and I asked a question to this person who went to a very reputable law school. It is a phrase, separation of church and state in the Constitution. And as an attorney, they said to me, I'm not sure. Now, here's a person who practices law. Here's a person who graduated uh, with a law degree from a reputable you know, law school. And, you, and they were not sure if that phrase separation of church and state is found in the Constitution. Now, if they don't know, right. then the average everyday person has Definitely no clue either. Way. So again, so when someone says, so what about separating church and state? Again, I remind them that phrase separation of church and state is found nowhere in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, but as, as a matter of fact, speaking of the Constitution, when you look at the Constitution, and this was one of the arguments that I saw uh, recently uh, uh, that was uh, a CNN reporter was basically trying to um, trip up or have a gotcha moment with one of our elected officials here in Louisiana. Um, they, be, they begin to look and say, well, the Constitution is a secular document. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I wanted to say to that person, uh, no, the framers of the Constitution use the Bible as a source of authority, right? as a source of, of inspiration, writing the Constitution. What do I mean by that? When you look at the framers of the Constitution and, and what they used to bring in ideas, 
to frame the Constitution, one of the first sources was William Blackstone mm -hmm. and his legal commentaries published from 1766 to 1769, four volumes. This was the basically the commentaries that most lawyers used in our country. So William Blackstone definitely was an inspiration uh, and basically a resource and reference to our Constitution. Number two, John Locke. Uh, in 1690, he wrote the Treaties of Government. But the most used and quoted of all sources for our Constitution is the Bible. <laughs> the ideas of our Constitution, the writings of our Constitution, uh, the, the most cited sources, if you will, uh, basically comes from the Word of God. For example, and this is something that we can just kind of look at real quick, and there's several examples, but here's just two or three. Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution talks about a Sunday exemption clause, which means that that if a uh, the president is to sign off uh, on what Congress has passed, he's got 10 days with the exception of Sunday. <laughs> and the reason for that is because Sunday is recognized day of worship for Christians. That's right. That's found in our Constitution. The oaths, uh, again, which is very important to note, is that there are five clauses uh, on taking oaths in our Constitution. Now, again, uh, the founder of this particular part of our Constitution, Rufus King, made it clear that an oath implies a belief in God. Mm. So again, you have that. You know, all this comes from the Bible. So the point is, is that acknowledging God is not establishing a religion. Right. And this is where, again, people say, well, what about the Establishment Clause? What about, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the First Amendment, you know, uh, the Establishment Clause? Well, the reality simply is this. Acknowledging God is not the establishment of a religion. Yeah. And when you read the First Amendment, it says Congress, mm -hmm. Congress shall not. And so... The reality is that if a governor or a mayor or a teacher or a principal or someone acknowledges God, that is not establishing a religion. Right. There's nowhere that says all citizens of yes must be Baptist or Catholic or mm -hmm. Methodist or Presbyterian or whatever. So this is why, again, uh, again, Christian sermons were preached in the House of Representatives. Uh, one of the great sermons was called The Public Worship of God, uh, all found and all read and all declared in our nation's capital. Uh, capital punishment uh, is found two times in the Constitution. Uh, and it comes from the Bible, Deuteronomy 17.6. Uh, where it says in, concerning treason, uh, there must be actual two actually two eyewitnesses must be given in order for capital punishment to occur when it comes to the issue of treason. This is Article 3, Section 3. Where did this come from? It came right out of the Bible from Deuteronomy 17.6. Right. So those are just some examples, just some small examples that throughout our Constitution you find woven principles from the Word of God because it was the Word of God that inspired, that influenced uh, the framers of our Constitution. So to say the Constitution is a completely secular document means one of two things, or both. Number one, you know nothing about the Constitution. Or number two, you know nothing about the Bible, or both. <laughs> there you go. And, 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 and I hate to say it that way, but, but again, the Word of God says, my people perish yeah, for a for lack, lack of, of knowledge. knowledge. So this is why, and this is the point I want to make primarily, in the Supreme Court decision of 1892, Church of the Holy Trinity versus United States, Justice Brewer said these words, these, and I quote, these and many other matters which might be noticed add a volume of an unofficial declaration that this is a Christian nation. What he meant by that was this. When they were trying to determine and discern whether or not this was a Christian nation, they looked at all the founding documents, some that we talked about, the Mayflower Compact, the Declaration, uh, the Bible, the treaties of, uh, of various treaties that have been signed and given. And they, they concluded that when you look at what the founders of our nation said, their quotes, uh, the things they believed in, the things that they signed off on, the things that they, that they brought into their documents, after examining all of these things, they concluded this is indeed a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's important that people know this. Um, this is why when you go to our nation's capital uh, and you look into the rotunda and you see the great murals there in our nation's capital, you see the baptism of Pocahontas, you see the Bible study of the pilgrims, and you see um, the landing of Columbus with people praying. Mm -hmm. So there's prayers, Bible studies, and baptisms in our 
nation's capital, right, right there in the rotunda mm-hmm. of some of the great paintings uh, there in, in our nation's capital. So again, this is these are all things that people never either ever never learn or they have forgotten or they never connected the dots. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Many other founders, like John Jay, the first chief uh, justice of the Supreme Court, wanted to make it mandatory that in order to serve in public office, you had to be a Christian. Mm. Uh, Patrick Henry made it clear. He says, our nation was founded by Christians. Uh, the list could go on. I mean, we could be right. here for another hour. <laughs> uh, but the point is, all of these individuals pointed to God and to the Christian faith. Even Thomas Jefferson, the most secular of all of the founding fathers, many will argue, right. used federal dollars to fund missions and missionaries to, again, to bring the gospel to Native Americans. Mm. So, again, every nation is founded on a religious philosophy. Mm-hmm. Even atheist countries uh, have a certain philosophy upon which to build upon. Because our country was founded upon the Bible, and because our country was founded upon Christianity, we have freedoms unlike anybody else in the world. Right. Which means this, because I know what some people are thinking, what about the Muslim or what about the atheist or what about, I, I get that. Mm-hmm. And here's what I'll say to all those individuals. You as a Muslim, as an atheist, whoever you want to be, can live in our nation. You can run for office. Yep. You can teach in our universities. Yep. You can own properties. Uh, you can... Um, teach in our schools, build businesses, you know, have all the freedoms and liberties of anyone and be an atheist or whatever you want to be or nothing at all. Mm-hmm. And that's perfectly fine because you live in a nation that says, again, you have the freedom to do and be and grow and do whatever you want to do or nothing at all. Again, work, own property, have business, run for office. But here's my point. Yep. If as a Christian, mm-hmm. you go to an atheist country, Right. Will you have those same privileges? No, absolutely not. 99.9% absolutely not. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, if you go to an atheist country as a Christian, you may not even be allowed to have freedom at all. Mm -hmm. If you go to a Muslim nation, in most cases, are you free to carry your New Testament and Mm -hmm. worship in a church or to share someone or to to share your faith with someone there in a Muslim nation. In most of these nations, if you do, that would be considered a capital crime. Capital punishment, yeah. So here's the point. Because we were founded upon a Christian worldview, because the Bible is the center of what we say and do, because Mm -hmm. we have this, again, foundation on the Christian faith, liberties, opportunities, um, privileges are ours unlike anyone else or any other nation ever to exist. And we need to understand this, because if we don't, I'm afraid that our nation is going to continue to have some very severe problems, very Mm -hmm. similar to what Canada is doing now, uh, where they are restricting freedom of speech, Mm -hmm. they're restricting freedom of certain expressions of certain religious content and viewpoints, same is true in Finland, Mm -hmm. and the list could go on. So the point simply is this, as we, again, approaching our nation's uh, holiday, if you will, uh, the 4th of July, the, the, the founding of, of our country, we have to understand something, that if we don't use our freedom mm. to keep our freedom, we'll lose our freedom. Yeah. I'm going to say that again. For those of you who are just tuning in, if we don't use our freedoms to keep our freedoms, we will lose our freedoms. So beware of the theophobic person, the person who is afraid of anything to do with theology, or the deophobic person, person afraid of anything to do with God. Because again, acknowledging God is not establishment. We are, again, simply declaring God's providence now in our schools, in our churches, in our businesses, in our halls of government. We're simply declaring God's providence as we did in the very beginning. Uh, Again, there is no um, basically problem with us saying our nation's motto, in God we trust. Right, right. That is our nation's motto because we recognize that's from whom we come and that is who we will be blessed by and that is who one day we will give an account to, our Heavenly Father, the mm. God who founded this amazing nation. That's right. And just because the Constitution is not a theology book, it is a book that's based on Christian theology. Well, exactly. I mean, 
woven throughout the Constitution is uh, Christian principles that our founders knew and applied and were definitely inspired to share and to, uh, to implement. Well, there you have it from the Family Answer Man. I want to say thanks for joining us again today. We hope that this uh, episode of the Family Answer Man has inspired you to make changes that will lead to a stronger, healthier, happier family.